Thank you. Uh, so I work in Oslo, the capital of uh, Norway, uh, and uh, lead the Fall Line project. Uh, this is downtown Oslo with the Opera House here, if you're familiar with this. And the area I marked in the red uh, uh, square is the medieval part of the, the city. Um, this red uh, boundary shows the protected area. And um, the railway for the Fall Line requires the largest excavations in medieval Oslo since the turn of the last century. And uh, among these discoveries are three secular masonry buildings, here marked in yellow. The buildings lie close to um, this present day building, which is built on the cellars of the Episcopal, Episcopal complex. And here is the medieval situation with the Bishop Street uh, leading from the town square to the harbor in the west. And as you can see, the present day situation, the present day street follows the same route. The context of these uh, three buildings, in addition to earlier known masonry buildings uh, in this area, is the subject of this paper. One of the excavated buildings is dated to the four, late 13th or early 14th century, and the others, the other two, are uh, dated to the 14th or early 15th century. Earlier, most uh, secular masonry buildings in the excavated part of Oslo have been considered to be post-medieval. Such an interpretation affects the building's heritage status. Since most cultural heritage monuments in um, post-dating the Christian Reformation in 1537 are not protected by the Norwegian cultural heritage law. Uh, these buildings are sometimes excavated with uh, limited documentation. One clarification is needed at this uh, point. By secular masonry buildings, I mean stone and mortar uh, constructions, not part of churches or royal or episcopal complexes. The masonry constructions can be uh, entire buildings with one or, one or more stone built floors. Alternatively, only cellars or subfloors below timber buildings, which is a common layout or a well known layout from the medieval countryside in Norway. The discovery that three recently excavated buildings are medieval accentuated the need to revisit Oslo's mas secular masonry uh, buildings, to reevaluate their dating and challenged the impression of a medieval town almost exclusively timber constructed with low houses built around the towering high status masonry complexes belonging to the bishop, the king, and the monastic orders. Datable artifacts and stratigraphic information are generally, generally lacking from the late 19th and early 20th century excavation of the town's secular buildings. The primary reason for this is that many of these investigations were led by architects who focused on the monumental royal and ecclesiastical architecture. Secular dwellings or storehouses were simply not considered equally interesting. The limited documentation from these investigations often exists only as unpublished diaries and drawings. The largest of our three excavated buildings was already known from a 1954 excavation, the area which here is marked in red. And here in orange is the, the part of the building that was uh, excavated in 1954. Based on artifacts and similarity to other presumed post-medieval buildings, it was interpreted as being from the late 16th or early 17th century. It was even associated with the 17th century town hall, which would fit the building's prominent position in the town. Here is our part of the building with the previously excavated area inside the culvert on the right. Oak beams below the topmost floor layer were dendrochronologically dated, showing that the trees were felled in 1298 and 1299. Piles under the western internal wall were radiocarbon dated to uh, AD 1270 to 1380. Piles under the southern wall gave exactly the same result, 
suggesting accurate dating. Uh, the pile foundations themselves were significant, uh, coupled with the thickness of the walls. They suggest two stories above the, above the cellar. During the 1954 excavation, a western room with a staircase was uh, removed. And in our excavation, the cellar was found to continue east of the excavation area to the left in this image. Thus, the building had at least three rooms with a minimum ground plan of 117 square meters. The inner wall faces were even, and the outer wall faces were uh, rough, without a smooth wall face, showing that this part of the building was a dug-down cellar. All rooms had cobblestone floors. There, remain there were remains of wooden paving above, on which 17th uh, century ceramics were found. But these artifacts are obviously remnants of the building's final use period, or even infilling. And then another building, this is the one I just talked about, and, and this is the, the present building, uh, lay to the south. Its uh, pile foundation was really accommodated to the 14th or early 15th century. It had an intricate uh, drainage system and six floor layers. Only a small part of this building was excavated, and it continued out of the excavation area to the east. A third building lay north of the Bishop Street. This was just west of the Bishop's Palace, which is here, in an area previously thought to be uh, the Bishop's Garden or Field, and thus not settled in the medieval period. The building's preserved wall had wooden raft foundation, as you can see here, and here, and here, and a badly preserved wooden floor where we found hundreds of chicken bones, and we're playing with the idea that we have excavated a tavern. If not able to re radiocarbon date or dendrochronologically date features, stratigraphy is a preferable method for dating rather than artifacts from the building's use period. Here we see a building for the north in Oslo placed within a medieval church. And here is another one in the cemetery. A third building blocks the medieval street. Based on stratigraphy and context, uh, all three buildings are probably post-medieval constructions. Back in our, our area, however, there's uh, this building, which was identified in 1904, uh, which uh, seemingly respects the medieval street's layout. The post-medieval street in the area was wider, thus indicating that's, that this particular building is medieval. The post medieval, uh, the medieval street even fits with this building further west. We will excavate this building in 2017. Written sources can sometimes uh, help us get an overview of the total number of masonry buildings in the town. The Norwegian diploma material contains information on Oslo's, Oslo's secular dwellings by, provi by providing the name of approximately 70 plots. These diplomas mention close to 20 masonry cellars or buildings in these plots. However, it's uh, speculative to base the number of masonry buildings on the written sources alone, as we have no way of knowing how many documents are lost. Furthermore, several of, several of these buildings referred to in the diplomas might have been masonry buildings without being specified as such. Adding the ones located by excavation, the number of masonry buildings uh, in uh, Oslo is almost 60. And undoubtedly, there are additional buildings not yet discovered. 40 of the masonry buildings have previously been interpreted as being post medieval, here shown in an um, interpretation of Oslo AD 1624, before the whole city burned. However, most of these building, buildings lack absolute dating. The main reason for the assumption that the buildings are post medieval is the Reformation in 1537, when most of Oslo's churches were torn down and the stones reused for foundations, chimneys, and cellars. This is true for many of the masonry constructions, but certainly not all. <coughs> the presence of cobblestone floor has been used to argue a post-medieval date. However, such floors were used in medieval masonry buildings, as demonstrated by the building I've already talked about on the left, 
as well as another building we recently excavated further south in the town, here shown on the right. Furthermore, buildings might have been in use for several centuries, with many subsequent floor layers. The topmost floor might be post-medieval, but the original floor uh, or original building could be <coughs> centuries older. Thus, artifacts found on the topmost floor layers do not prove or even indicate original dates. Another established truth is that while the method of wooden pile foundation was used in the medieval period, wooden raft foundation was used in the post-medieval period. This, however, is also erroneous, as we can see from one of our excavated buildings and the from excavations of St. Olaf's Monastery and the eastern wing of the bishop's palace. That three out of three excavated buildings close to the bishop's uh, palace proved to be medieval tells us that an, that uncritical repetition of earlier interpretations should be avoided. It should not be assumed that these buildings are post-medieval. There are at least two, possibly four, buildings which we will investigate in the following excavation in the follow line project. These also lie close to the bishop's palace and parallel to the main thoroughfare from the town square to the harbor. Provided all of them are medieval, these buildings suggest a revised image of Oslo's urban topography. One of the buildings was the one I mentioned lying next to the medieval street. Very little can be known about this building from the limited documentation at hand, but there is nothing in the documentation that it excludes it from being uh, medieval. Uh, the other building lies north of the large building I talked about earlier, and these two buildings have similar <laughs> dimensions. And there are even two walls further north that could be remains from masonry buildings. Together, these features suggest a tantalizing possibility of the area around the bishop's palace being occupied by several contemporary masonry buildings in the medieval period. Perhaps each side of the street from the harbor and up to the bishop's palace was partly lined with masonry facades. Very little of this area has yet been excavated. This winter, however, I will start a new excavation project in precisely this area. The prominent position of the buildings along one of the town's main thoroughfares, even around the town square, suggests that masonry architecture was employed as a social marker in the medieval town. The exact layout of the time, uh, town square in Oslo is unknown, but estimated to lie in this area. I'm currently working on a hypothesis with a revised layout of the triangular town square, based on the location of the masonry buildings and the orientation of the bishop's street. Please note this building here, <coughs> on the southern side of this possible town square, adhering to this layout. The masonry buildings uh, undoubtedly had a practical function for safe storage and easy transportation of uh, goods coming into the harbor in the west, being transported up the Bishop Street and into masonry storage buildings. But the buildings probably also allowed aristocrats or an aspiring merchant class to show off their wealth. In the early 14th century, King Håkon V died with subsequent changes in the political landscape when the royal power transfers to Sweden. Without a Norwegian king residing in Oslo, a power vacuum might have been created to be filled by other actors. By using the masonry architecture, these actors could make their mark upon the urban topography. And finally, this revised image of Oslo's medieval topography not only affects the way we view the past, but it also affects the present and future cultural heritage management since excavated masonry buildings, at least initially, will have to be treated as protected medieval monuments. Thank you.